My favorite plant to grow in my yard is the fruit tree because you plant it once and you get fruit for decades. If you have ever been curious on the best ways to be successful in growing fruit trees, today is your lucky day. Why? Because my team and I have compiled our best interviews and videos in one place to assist you in growing your own toe-tingling peaches and awesome apples right out your front or back door. Plus, as an added bonus, we've included an in-depth guide to successfully growing fruit trees in your yard. To get access to this information, it's free by the way, just go to urbanorchard.org or text FRUIT to 33444. That's urbanorchard.org or text FRUIT to 33444. You're listening to the Urban Farm Podcast, your partner in the Grow Your Own Food revolution. Whether you've just been introduced to urban farming or you're a lifelong advocate, we're sure you'll leave feeling more informed, equipped, and empowered to dig deeper into the soil of your local food economy. With you every step of the way, here's your host, Greg Peterson. Today on the Urban Farm Podcast, we have Susan Poisner of Orchard People to talk about her experience with growing awesome fruit trees. Susan is an urban orchardist in Toronto, Canada. She is the author of the award-winning fruit tree care book, Growing Urban Orchards, and the creator of the award-winning online fruit tree care training course. In her in-person and online workshops, Susan has trained hundreds of students across North America including master gardeners, arborists, and people who are completely new to gardening and fruit tree care. Susan is also the host and creator of the Urban Forestry Radio Show and podcast on realityradio101.com. Welcome to the show today, Susan. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Oh my gosh, absolutely. So I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took to get where you're at now? Well, it was quite an adventure, quite a journey, I would say. It's funny because I was a gardener, you know, I worked for the City of Toronto as a gardener Mm -hmm. um, for three years, and so I was knowledgeable about plants and trees, and I came up with what I thought was a brilliant idea, Uh and I thought, well... I think that I should plant a community orchard in my local park. Now, this was 2008, and at that time, there was really no such thing as a community orchard here Uh in Toronto. (laughs) Or anywhere else in the world, for that matter. Or anywhere else. Well, I had been to uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, and in in BC, I, I stumbled upon a community orchard. I thought, wow, this is a fabulous idea. I was all about growing vegetables in my yard, and I'm like, this is a great project because people don't always have room for fruit trees in their own backyard. Right. And it's something that we can all do together. You know, we can, you know, plant these things together, harvest them together. It'll be so much fun. Mm -hmm. So I came, you know, after that trip, I came back to Toronto and I decided this is it. I'm going to do this project. So I talked to one of my neighbors who is actually my gardening hero. And her name is Sherry, yes, and she's so knowledgeable about everything. And she, I told her the idea, I said, Sherry, tell me, like, I'm not crazy, am I? I want to do this. And I thought she was going to say, yeah, you're kind of crazy. But she (laughs) said, no, let's do it. So we had to speak to our city councillor, and he's really fabulous. Joe Mahavik is um, very into the environment, and and community projects, and he's like, this is a great idea. Uh Let's get the community together and propose it. Now, I had heard that the city of Toronto, where I live, they can be really a little bit funny about projects like this. You know, they're afraid that it's going to fall apart. You're going to have messy fruit trees left and neglected. Yep. So we had quite a journey in working with the community. Some people wanted the project, some people didn't. It was a challenge. We had some challenges early on, Mm. and I can talk about that at some point if you want. But we had some people who really didn't want an orchard in our park. (laughs) So ultimately, we got a compromise, and we got to plant 14 fruit trees in our local park. And this park, by the way, was a place that nobody really hung around in. Like, it just was not a really interesting place to visit. Uh And there was an old rotting playground. So we planted the trees. And I'm a gardener, so I'm thinking, well, this is going to be easy. I know how to plant trees. 
But then I started to research what types of trees that I wanted. So I got all sorts of books out of the library, and I read these books, and they're like, oh. So I talked to the city city of Toronto Parks and Rec guy that I was working with, Mm -hmm. and I said, could we have these varieties? And I gave him the the varieties recommended in these books, and he's like, "Um, Susan, I'm, I'm sorry, we can't get these varieties here in Toronto. So long story short, the learning started early on. <laughs> A, I'll that say. you <laughs> you really have to do research to find varieties not only that are available mm-hmm. in your community, but that are actually appropriate for your climate, yeah. for the conditions in your community, that are hopefully disease resistant, which is another challenge I faced. So from the moment those trees came, were planted in the ground, I had quite... A challenge ahead of me. I had to learn how to take care of them, mm-hmm. partly because some people in the community really wanted us to fail, and they did not want the fruit trees there. And I realized I had to take very good care of these trees and make sure they didn't get diseased or they weren't abandoned. You know, so my next project was, okay, I know fruit trees need pruning, but I don't know anything about it. Right. So I had to research that. And the story goes on and on and on, but that's how it all began. So it started with a little community orchard and a lot of learning. And then what happened next was other groups wanted to follow in our footsteps. <laughs> Love it's that. funny because it's, it's wonderful because our park, I didn't even know what this park was called. It's called Ben Nobleman Park. Now, I for years didn't even know who Ben Nobleman was. Nobody knew the name of the park. This tiny little, not big park that's near a busy road. Uh Anyways, people were going to Parks and Recreation and they were saying, we want to be like Ben Nobleman. We want to have fruit trees. (laughs) Nice. So so that's what happened. So basically people were coming to me for help. And those that weren't coming to me for help, when I spoke to them, I discovered that they were making all the same mistakes that I made. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, don't do that mistake. I did that one already. Let me tell you how to not do that particular mistake and let me tell you how to get it right the first time. So sometimes I caught groups and people in time, sometimes I didn't. didn't, yeah. And so from there, I ended up uh, helping groups uh, professionally. As a consultant, I ended up writing my book, which is called Growing Urban Orchards, Mm -hmm. where I I basically boil fruit tree care down to what is the minimum that you have to do in order to care for your trees properly so they'll be healthy and productive. Right. And, And I start right from the beginning about how to research your tree, winter and summer pruning, planting, early years care, pest and disease prevention and soil and and fertility management. Wow. So it's been a journey. It's been an odyssey, I would say. (laughs) So I I, I just typed into a Google search bar, Ben Nobleman. And do you know what the first thing that came up? It kind of auto-filled it. I would love to know. Ben Nobleman Park Community Orchard. Yay, very nice. Yeah. Uh, just Just with Ben Nobleman in there. So... Wow, you must be doing something right. Well, what's interesting is, so we planted our fruit trees in 2009, Uh and my background before gardening is I'm a journalist, I'm a filmmaker, I've worked in radio and television, all sorts of stuff for years, so I'm good at, like, communicating. So I created a website for us, and in the website, I did a... Uh, like Fruit Trees 101 page for uh-huh. other groups that were starting community orchards. And so I got, the website is called communityorchard.ca, CA for Canada. Yep. And so at one point, I don't know if this is still true, if you Googled what is a community orchard, that website would come up, Ben Nobleman Park Community Orchard's website. So I don't know if that's still the case. We're finding out right now. Yep. It it's still does. a case. It's still up there. Very yep, good. It is. <laughs> so, so yeah. So, so yay so for that's... you. Oh, thank you. So I want to know who and why, who didn't want and why didn't they want fruit trees in a park? That makes no sense to me. Oh my goodness. I don't want all what the dirty details, say? but what, what was to complain about having fruit trees in a park? Well, When we did our presentation to the community, Mm -hmm. I live in a community that on one side is people that that are quite wealthy and the other side is people that are not super wealthy. Mm. And I'm in the street right between the two. 
And so we had this community meeting, and I presented the, the idea. I, I did a map of what the orchard would look like, and everybody clapped. And it, I thought, gee, that went well. <laughs> um, but there was one person who was there who was quite concerned. Mm. And instead of talking to me to say, what is this involved and whatever, she decided to go around with uh, a couple of other women with a petition saying that we were planting a fruit farm in the park mm -hmm. and that this was dangerous, that we were going to destroy the park, we were going to take over the park. <clears throat> so <laughs> my city councillor then organized, uh, we got an idea of some of their fears. Uh -huh. We wish they would have talked to us directly, right, but exactly. you know they were afraid that, that more fruit trees would bring more bees and that would bite their children, oh. things like that. Well. So we organized a second community meeting, and <laughs> this was in a local synagogue. And so here's the atmosphere. In uh, sadly, in the local synagogue, you have they have security, so they have to check your bag to make sure that there's I don't know no weapons or right. whatever. And it had nothing to do with the, our community meeting, but there were some people that thought it did because there was mm. so much anger. So at this next community meeting, we brought in experts to talk about wow. how nature and children and how good it is for children to be interacting with nature. Mm -hmm. um, we had somebody do some research on bees um, and, you know, is it having fruit trees? Is that going to attract more bees? We brought in all sorts of experts, uh -huh. but it was a really nasty, angry meeting. Oh. So you asked me a question. You said, what were their main concerns? Yeah. So concerns included bees. And, and that's okay. I understand yeah. that concern. I, we can talk about it. We did research and we found out that actually there are already flowering shrubs in the park. It won't attract more, more bees, bees or less right. bees. Okay? Yeah. Um, but then other concerns were my kids will get cherry stains on their t-shirts. Okay, that was um, me laughing. Sorry. Okay. And then other concerns are, and this is sad, that they felt that it would attract hungry homeless people to mm. our park. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, if there are people who are hungry, let them come and pick the fruit. Yeah. You know, <laughs> um, that. that's the whole point, that's right? Whole point. Uh, you know, yeah. then there was, and, and I think that there were some people who were taking it a little too far, increased rapes and murders. <laughs> I, I'm not kidding you. What? There were some, honestly, wow. there was one woman who was concerned that there, all these extra trees would produce more cover so people could hide and do sneaky stuff and mm. violence and horrible things behind the trees and that was just that was just kind of silly so yeah that's wow. what we had to face All and right. in the end my city councillor is such a brave man and we we originally wanted to plant i think 24 fruit trees 40 trees in total because we were going to have service berries which is a native fruiting tree uh -huh. and tree and other anyways in the end instead of the 24 fruit trees we got 14 so well, you know what that's beautiful and yeah. it was a pilot project and they would see how it you know the city would see how Ben Nobleman did, and if we were a success, they would allow other parks <laughs> to follow suit. And it sounds like you have been. <laughs> yes. So what are the? So that was two thousand and nine, right? Yes. So and you actually planted in then two thousand nine or ten. We planted uh, the first nine in two thousand and nine. The remaining ones in twenty ten. How are they doing? And in they're doing great. I mean, it's been interesting because, again, I mentioned to you early on how much learning was involved. Mm -hmm. And in the end, while I thought I researched my fruit trees, I didn't because the books I was reading were from uh, <laughs> California. So <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> I really didn't. And when I submitted these for wonderful varieties that I wanted to plant, the Parks and Rec guy said to me, um, Susan, we can't get these varieties. That's mm -hmm. not possible, mm -hmm. but I'll get you some Bartlett pears, some Macintosh apples, some, yep. you know, all those typical varieties that you get in the supermarket that are probably not the best to grow organically. Right. So some of our trees are still there from the early years. Some of them we've had to take out because mm -hmm. they've been diseased. We, we never let, we watch our trees like hawks mm -hmm. because I feel so responsible that this orchard needs to be healthy. I want my orchard to bring beautiful things and beautiful yeah. energy and beautiful fruit to the community, not to be a spreader of disease. Yeah. 
And so we've had to remove and replace trees, but it's a beautiful park now. And the interesting thing is that by planting these trees, it started a transformation. At first, it was a park that nobody spent time in. And then suddenly, every couple of weeks on stewardship days, the park would be filled with a bunch of volunteers with brightly colored T-shirts caring for the trees. Mm -hmm. We renovated a beautiful garden into a pollinator garden. That took us like 200 hours one year. Wow. And so all of a sudden, the park started changing. And then there was money for a new playground. Hmm. And interestingly, some of the people who were involved in the opposition to the orchard, they were like, okay, well, we want a piece of the action here. We want to have a say what goes on in our park. And they helped to design the playground. And frankly, they did a beautiful job. Wow. So so that's what happened. Yeah. Now, about community, and you asked me about community. In Uh 2010, because it started with such mixed feelings. Right. We decided to have a harvest festival, even though we had no harvest yet. Uh-huh. And so um, we organized a really fun harvest festivals with booths and giving away free fruit that we got from a farm and all sorts of fun stuff. And I did some orchard tours. This little park that nobody ever went to was on our harvest festival day. Somehow people found out it was in the papers and stuff. 400 people showed up wow. to our festival. And one of the guys that signed the petition, 60 people signed the peti- petition saying they didn't want the orchard, mostly uh-huh. because these three uh, or four people kind of made them feel concerned about what was going to happen. So one guy who signed the petition, he came up to me, said, Susan, I didn't had no idea this was going to be so wonderful. Wow. And he said, our park looks fantastic with people in it. <sighs> wow. That was a rewarding moment. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so one of the reasons that I do what I do in the world and I'm doing this podcast is I look for epic things. And one way that I know if something is epic is if it brings me to tears. Mm. And I'm right there. <laughs> because I oh, know God. I know what it takes to do what you did. I have two. I have two degrees. Um, I went back to school late in life, and I got two degrees: a bachelor's and a master's in urban planning. And so I know dealing with communities, and I know what it takes to do what you've done. And you have forever changed that park and mm. the community around the park, and probably dozens, if not hundreds, of other parks around Canada and the United States. Yeah. So, yay yeah. on you! That is epic. So thank it's you. It's funny. I, I, w- I was walking through the park today, and I walk through it all the time because uh-huh. it's on the way up the street to the shops. And I walked through, and I thought, you know, these trees are so beautiful. And yeah. I thought it'll be the most rewarding thing in my life if I can walk through in 20 years' time and see them big and strong and producing yep. fruits, so strong that kids can climb on them. <laughs> yeah. That would be the biggest achievement of my life. I can't necessarily monitor how many people have bought my book, how many Uh people have taken my courses. You know, I've worked with different communities around the city. I won't really be able to see what changes I've made in their lives, Mm -hmm. but I can see those trees and I can see what changes I've made in that beautiful park. And amazing to call it beautiful, but it is. Yeah. It never was. And now it is. Now it is. Wow. So, yeah. So let's talk about your book. Uh, How did you come to write a book about fruit tree care? Well, again, so I'm the kind of person that I learn things, and I, I'm not an easy learner. Like, I really, for instance, we had to bring in experts to teach us how to prune the trees, mm-hmm. and I found a way. I raised money. I got grants so we could bring in people from the fruit-growing region a couple of hours away. I had to do this workshop with this wonderful man three times before I understood <laughs> uh-huh. how to prune a fruit tree. Uh-huh. I, he was lovely, and he was explaining it, and he's one of my heroes, and he's one of my mentors, and I just didn't get it until I got it. Right. And then when I got it, it just crystallized, and one of my skills is communication. So I'm mm. like, oh, this is easy. It's five steps. Right. <laughs> So I started to write this stuff down, and I thought, you know, so many people are coming to me for help. I'm a good writer, and I make things not scary for people. I do it in a storytelling way, Mm -hmm. and I thought, I'm going to write a book. And I never, I didn't get, I I self-published the book. um, I'm happy to say it got an award, which is very nice. 
And so it sells very nicely. And that was self-published. And it's 101 pages or 111 pages. And I just tell the whole story. I tell the story of our orchard while teaching people everything that they need to know in order to care for fruit trees. Great. What's the name of the book? It's called Growing Urban Orchards. Mm -hmm. And it's on Amazon. Dot com, or you can get it from my website at orchardpeople.com slash book. You can even get an ebook version of it as well. Cool. For those of us that like to hold on to the book, I can get one. Get a copy of it. <laughs> cool. Yeah, it's nice to have a physical copy, especially with 111 pages. It's like you don't really want to be staring at the computer, but some people long. you can get it cheaper and, yeah. you know, they just... Yeah. And one lovely thing is uh, the Baltimore Orchard Project is using my book as a textbook. They teach wonderful classes there to people. They have a fabulous project. Uh And so um, this year they ordered uh, from me uh, 20 copies. And all the students in this, I think it's like a five-part course or something. Uh All the students will get a copy of the book while they go through and learn all about how to steward their trees. Fantastic. Okay, good. So then the next step was to develop online training. Tell us about that. So, as I said, my background is I'm a filmmaker, Mm -hmm. and there's some people, people learn in different ways. So what made me think, I'm just trying to remember what the idea was, why I decided that I felt, I just felt I had more to tell, and I felt that sometimes things like, I feel in my book, I very clearly describe the the five steps to pruning and why you prune and all that stuff. But there was there was more that I could fit in, and people sometimes need to see rather than read. Uh-huh. People learn in different ways, and so I just started to. I can't even remember what what brought it to mind, but I just slowly started to put together these online workshops using the zillions of beautiful pictures I've taken over the years, uh-huh. and also. My book was written from the perspective of what I learned in Ben Nobleman Park Community Orchard. But I've been working with groups around Toronto and beyond, actually, but specifically in Toronto and watching them, and they've faced problems and issues that we have never faced. And so I was learning more and more, and I felt, I think this is more than even a book can accommodate. But you also don't want to overwhelm people. You want to make it fun. So I divided it up into five workshops. And in total, it's about eight hours of video. So these videos are short because I know people don't always have time to sit and watch for an hour. So each video lesson is maximum 15 minutes long. Right. And so, for instance, in my workshop on how to choose a fruit tree that's appropriate for your conditions, Uh I take you through step by step what you need to do to research it. And you do your research as you go along for your environment. Mm. I take you through it and we're doing it together, essentially. So, yeah, so I developed that. I did sort of a soft launch at first Mm -hmm. and I wanted to make sure that it was good. I get such great uh, feedback. So what's happened is since it's been completed and finally launched, I've been getting um, students who are arborists because arborists, I don't know about in the States, but in Canada, arborists are really well trained, but they're not trained in fruit tree care. That's considered, yeah, that's considered more sort of like agricultural in a way. Exactly. Yeah. So um, I train... um, Arborists that are a part of an organization called the um, International Society of Arboriculture. Oh, wow. And they get, uh, yeah, they get credits. They get up to eight continuing education credits mm-hmm. by doing my course. And I train master gardeners. And oh. I train people who have never gardened at all, never <laughs> planted a tree before. So I'm able to do that straddle just by having fun with it. Yeah. And, you know, frankly, being humble is important because yeah. I admit to all the mistakes I made because I know that that's how people will learn. I would love Mm -hmm. to be perfect. I am absolutely (laughs) not perfect. Uh (laughs) So um, you kind of have a good laugh as you go through and you think, man, that was a dumb thing. Why didn't she know how to do that? But then, you know, anybody can make those mistakes and we learn from them. Right. Yeah. So I, I know that online learning is a great way to learn. So there's five steps in your program. Tell us quickly what they are and what the cost of the program is. Sure. Okay. So I've divided my course. It's like, I call it a certificate program Mm -hmm. into five parts. 
part one, you learn how to research your fruit tree. So you learn all about fruit tree, sort of biology, how they work, what they are really, Mm -hmm. and how to research your tree by going to your local fruit tree specialist nurseries and find a tree that's just right for you. So I take you through everything from pollination, disease resistance, root stock, all that stuff. That's part one. Mm -hmm. Part two is planting and early years care. Because in the early years, your little trees are going to need a lot more nurturing than they do once they're established. Part three is winter and summer pruning. What is the difference? How to do it? Mm -hmm. Very visual. Part four is soil and fertility management. So it's really about, and that covers a couple of things, how to treat, how to care for your trees and feed them once they're in the ground, but also how to prep the soil if you've got the time before you even plant your trees. Right. You know, so I, I do talk about cover crops and things like that, but not in a scary way at all. It's in a fun way. And part five, of course, is preventing pests and disease. Oh, yes. Perfect. So that's a big one. In each, after each little video, people do a quiz. So I, it's it's easy to, you know, you know, it's easy to be passive as you watch videos, but you know that there's going to be like a a three question quiz after the each little video. Mm -hmm. So in order to go to the next video, you have to kind of, you know, maybe take a few notes, maintain the information, take the quiz, and then at the end of the whole course, there is the final assessment, which is now 40 questions. Wow. And if you've gone through the course, it's obviously open book. You get a, a PDF copy of my uh, my book. Uh-huh. So if you need to check things, you can. But you take the final assessment, and if you get 70% or more, you will get your certificate in beginner fruit tree care. Nice. Nice. And you have, for our listeners, you have a discount code for this class, yes? And I have, especially for you and your, your folks, your mm-hmm. listeners, I have a discount code. So the price of the course is two hundred and fifty dollars USD, uh-huh. you know, US. But I am more than happy to offer your listeners a discount code. Cool. So if when they go in online and they order the course, they sign up. If they use this code, grow G R O W seven two three, and they'll get their discount. Perfect. 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 And that's at orchardpeople.com. And that's at orchardpeople.com slash workshops. Oh, very good. Perfect. So in our pre-conversation, I shared with you who I am in the world, which is I say that I'm the person responsible for transforming our global food system. And you said, that's interesting. That, and it made you think. And you shared something with me about who you were. Can you share that mm. with everybody? Absolutely. Oh, my God. I'm so I'm so touched by what you said. And I, I wonder to myself, so who am I in this world? And what is my mission? And I feel that I feel like I'm the guardian of the trees. Mm-hmm. I feel like I love trees. I love all trees. And I feel that trees are, um, we walk by them, we don't pay attention to them, we cut them down, we don't feed them, we put concrete all around them, we stick them in big concrete boxes on our main streets. It's like torture for trees. Yeah. So I, yeah, I feel like I'm the guardian of the trees, hmm. and I love fruit trees as well. And I feel that fruit trees, are a wonderful way to bring people into this world where we can understand these incredibly powerful beings that are trees Mm -hmm. that keep us alive in this world, that clean our air. And so people go, go in, get involved at first, you know, because of the fruit. Oh, I want the fruit. Yeah. And eventually if they are committed to fruit tree care, I find people, and I don't know if you find this as well, people develop a relationship with their trees. Yeah. And all of a sudden, it's not just a thing anymore. This is a being, and Mm -hmm. this is a being that needs our help. You know, I always say to people, you know, if you have a cat and a dog or a dog, like, do you feed your cat or your dog? Uh You know, put up your hand. If you feed your cat, they put up their hand. Everybody, yeah. You know, and, and, and how many of you feed your trees? Like, once their roots have consumed the nutrition in the soil, Mm -hmm. Where are they going to get? They can't pick themselves up, walk somewhere else to another piece of soil, <laughs> right. plant themselves there, yeah. and eat the soil there. 
so yes, I I believe that that's my my how I hope to make a difference in this world. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. So you also have a podcast, uh, the Urban Forestry Radio Show and Podcast. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh my goodness, it's been so much fun. So I can see now why you have a lot of fun with this podcast. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you get to meet amazing people. Oh, you get yeah. to learn such great stuff. Mm-hmm. And so I, uh, my podcast, what I do, it's called the Urban Forestry Radio Show. And it goes out live on a network called realityradio101.com. Mm-hmm. And so people can tune in live. And the funnest part is people can ask questions. Oh, so in each, nice. they email, they can email in their questions. So for each show, I have a, two guests. It's an hour-long show, so I have two guests talking about, you know, either a related topic with each other or different topics. Uh-huh. So just for example, I did a show on, well, a recent show was on cherry rootstock. You know, how, what selection, what, what the different rootstocks yeah. give us, what, co- what sizes of cherry trees are available. Or, oh, goodness, I've done uh, um, shows on hascaps. But the one I'm thinking of it, the most one of the most popular shows we got so many emails was on. I'm just trying to remember what is that orange berry? Oh my goodness, it's just slipped my mind. What is it called? <laughs> it's a, a oh goodness gracious. gooseberry. I know gooseberries are orange. So I go, just remembered. Okay, it's sea buckthorn is the uh, name of the orange berry. Yeah. And that's in episode 10. Uh-huh. And that's the one where people uh, were going nuts, emailing in their questions. We couldn't even fit all the questions yeah. into the show. I started to think, oh, my God, I need to make a longer show. So these berries, I think, are popular because they are a superfood. Oh, They've, they've yep. got tons of nutrients in yep. them. And they're popular as well because they're super easy to grow. Uh, it's shrubby. It spreads like crazy. You can turn it into jams, cosmetics, uh, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, There are people who are starting businesses with sea buckthorn superfood products. So that was one of the popular ones. And then, of course, we we cover diseases like I did a special on the horrible fire blight. And again, a lot of, (laughs) uh, sadly, a lot of uh, comments came about that. We're not the only ones suffering it. Oh, yeah, we have it down here here as well. So, yeah. Yeah. Cool. So what is the future of OrchardPeople.com? Where where do you see it going? Well, it's interesting because a lot of my work for the past couple of years, let's say two or three years, a lot of my work has been based here in Toronto. I work with these amazing community groups uh, um, around the city and various different neighborhoods. You know, they've raised money and um, I teach a certificate in fruit tree care to, to, to young people. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm encouraging them to find work doing this because here in nice. Toronto, we just don't have a, enough people who know how to prune fruit trees. So I, I do a lot of this in-person stuff, but I feel that the future is to work with other groups outside Toronto. Uh, yes. And through my website, I'm going to be starting offering some free webinars as well because like you, I really stand for education. I would rather people get some of the basics before they plant their trees. Yeah, big time. So I'm going to be doing some free webinars, and I am also developing an intermediate-level course in fruit tree care. So right now I'm working on a workshop. Uh, you know how they talk about reading tea leaves, you know, you oh, can yes. tell the future. by. Re- so this workshop is on reading tree leaves and what your oh. leaves of your trees will tell you. A lot. Um yeah, a lot about yeah. the health of your tree. Yeah. So, you know, part of the intermediate course is going to be more advanced stuff on pests and disease. Yeah. There's going to be a grafting se- section oh, and nice. espalier pruning because oh, I think nice. espalier is the way of the future in the city. Yeah. Espalier, so. you got to tell people what that is since you brought it up. Oh, really? Okay. Um, so espalier is amazing. Um, if you have a, a sunny yard in you know, if you were to plant a, a tree there, let's say a cherry tree or something, a sour cherry, it would take over your whole yard. Right. But if you do a spalier, you're planting your fruit trees and they are trained up against a fence. So they're two-dimensional. They're flat. Your mm. fence is a bunch of fruit trees. So in the space that you could have one full-size tree, you would have, you could have five. I was going to say five. Little smaller yeah. trees. Uh-huh. Yeah. Depending on how you design your espalier, you know, 
each tree could almost be just one stick with a bunch of fruit on it, or each tree can be a pattern. You can do beautiful patterns. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, espalier is a lot of fun. I'm excited about it. Nice. And it's just great for urban yards because oh, yeah. if we want to grow fruit, we don't need like a whole huge tree worth just for our families. Right. Right. And espalier can give you just enough to really enjoy, but uh, not too much. Perfect, perfect, perfect. So I'm going to shift on you, and I'd like for you to talk about a time you failed, how you overcame that failure, and what you might have learned from it. Yeah, <laughs> so many times. <laughs> how do I pick one? Welcome to life, yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, I'll tell you, the, the, the main, I would say, the main failure that I had was really, uh, how do I say this? When we planted our first trees, I mentioned that we didn't have much choice. We got what we got. We planted them in the ground. And in the first year we planted the trees, the the pears had little orange spots on them, just one or two. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, this is normal. I'm sure this is normal, of course. And I didn't do any research. And the next year, each tree of these three little young trees had, you know, quite a few orange spots on them. And I'm like, I'm... I'm sure it'll go away by itself. And I I didn't even come up close to look. Mm-hmm. It's like, let's face it, if your kids had early, you know, chicken pox, you know, had early stages, and if you were like, oh, no, it's fine. Yeah. Right? right. So that's what I did to my fruit trees. By the end of that season, those poor little trees were covered, covered with pear trellis rust, which is what oh. that is. It's a fungal disease that we get here. I'm not sure if you get it there. Nope. But because it's a, it's one that appears in humid environments. Right, That's probably exactly. why you guys are lucky not to get it. But um, so by the end of the year, I was like, we have a problem. So I took some pictures and I came close and I looked at the leaves and I saw the orange spots. And then I did the, I did the brave thing. I flipped the leaves over. Uh-oh. And on the other side, it looked like an alien invasion. Yeah. Like these horrible little like alien settlements of crazy little beings. <laughs> it just looked ugly. It was yeah. really ugly. And I thought, ah, oh, this is not good. So I took pictures of the front of the leaves. I took pictures of the back of the leaves. And I reached out to one of my fruit tree growing mentors who taught us. And I said, what is this? And he, the funny thing is, he said, I don't know. Ooh. And that's because um, Norm had, his orchard experience was not organic. So he worked oh. in regular orchards where they used fungicides to yep. spray the trees. So they would never have seen a fungal disease like this. It took a while. I figured out what it was. I figured out why we had the problem. Mm-hmm. And by the end of that season, we had to pull out the trees. They were young. They would never, you know, when a, as as you know, when a young tree is traumatized or stressed, um, it'll never quite recover. You know, yeah, it's sort of like, like in, you know, if, if a child is malnourished in their first years, they may have health problems all through their lives. So we decided to remove the trees. And then the following year, we, we did not plant pears again. We replaced right. them with uh, disease-resistant apple trees. So my big failure was pretending that these problems would pass no on way. their own. Yeah. 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 Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what do you consider your biggest success? Uh, well, recently I um, completed a project in uh, a, a wonderful neighborhood here in Toronto, um, it's wonderful, but very troubled. The area is called Jane and Finch, and there are a lot of shootings. There's a lot of violence. And at the same time, it is a really wonderful community. Yeah. It's just, you know, some of some people like it's people. There's a high unemployment. Young people are unemployed and some of the kids get involved in gangs and whatever. Anyways, a local organization raised some money to do um, an amazing greening project there. And as part of it, I taught my certificate in fruit tree care. And so it was a nine-part series. Each time I went for two hours, we did theory inside. We went outside and we did tons of fruit tree pruning. We pruned young trees. We pruned old trees. We discussed. We learned together. Mm -hmm. It was incredible. And what I loved most about this project was that in class one 
folks were sitting across from me with their arms crossed thinking, mm. what does this lady have to teach us? Yeah. And by the end, they were hugging me. Mm. And they were so proud to have this certificate. Some of these people had never completed a course in their life. Yeah. And they were so proud of what they had learned. There was one woman, and she said to me, um, one, on one of the pruning nights, she said, Susan, she said, I look at trees now and I see something totally different. I, I, I understand them and I think, how would I prune this tree and what would <laughs> I do and how could I help this tree? And it was so, a magical experience. Mm. So I taught this group for two years in a row. There were two each. The first year, there were different people. Second year, different people. In my second year, one of my students got a job managing an urban orchard here in Toronto. Wow. And I'm very proud of that. And I, I feel it's one of the things in my life that has made a big difference, where I can yeah. see the difference it makes. And I'm so proud of hmm. that. Nice. So... Uh, kind of then a follow-up question, what drives you? Yeah, good question. <laughs> oh, my gosh, good question. Yeah, you know, I think I want to make the world a better place. Yeah. I think that I, I, I'm drawn to teach. I'm drawn to learn. And you remember you asked me about, you know, why am I here? What's my mission? Yeah. I would love to be in a world where people are kind to each other and caring to each other and to be in a world where we're kind and caring to nature as well. Mm -hmm. And and this is my little piece. I can't stop wars all over the world. I can't necessarily change other things, but maybe bit by bit by teaching people how to care for trees, maybe they'll We'll all learn. We'll all learn to be better people. I'm, I'm not sure, really, but it gets me up in the morning. It gets me to my desk to learn and yeah. to be brave and to, you know, I'm quite an introvert. And so working with other people is, is, can be wonderful, mm -hmm. but um, it, it's, it's an effort. But I, I feel like it's my mission. Beautiful. So I'm all about education, and I have to know, is there a book that's been influential for you in this process? You know, I... I uh, it's a really good question because I have a bookshelf filled with books <laughs> all about fruit trees. And in each one, I get something really nice out of it. There's something that I really like about it. There's a book that I recently really enjoyed. I think it's called Grow a Little Fruit Tree. And that one was lovely and it really promotes something that I am really a fan of. And that's keeping our fruit trees compact. So we can harvest them, we can spray them if we need to, you know, so that we can take care of them. Once the tree gets too big, a lot of the fruit is wasted and mm -hmm. stuff. So I like that one, but I feel that most of my learning comes from my mentors and from the people who I yeah. interview on my radio show and from people like you. You know, you and I chat and we share our experiences and I learn from everybody that I talk to about their real life experiences. Mm -hmm. So. I'm not as much a book learner as I am learning from my experiences and from others' experiences. Yeah. I even said when I wrote my book that, and this is true, I traveled all over North America to talk to community orchardists to figure out what they were doing and how they could make it all work. And so a lot of those lessons are in my book. So, yeah, so I learn from people. Beautiful. I completely understand that one. So what one final piece of advice do you have for our listeners? Hmm. Well, I think your listeners are special because your listeners already care about fruit trees and plants. Mm -hmm. And I think my advice when I give talks to the general population is if you're going to plant a fruit tree, awesome, but you need to learn how to care for, care it. for it. If you're not going to, if you're just going to pop it in the ground and forget about it, my advice is don't plant don't it. Don't plant it. Yeah. <laughs> because ultimately the the problem is neglected trees spread disease from tree mm -hmm. to tree and and i just also think in terms of it's not doing any favors for the environment it's 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 just a stressed unhappy tree yeah so but let me think advice for people who are super already super involved in in mm -hmm. nature and gardening and the environment what's my advice 
Well, I guess my advice is build a relationship with each and every one of your trees. And we do this as we prune our trees, and each one has character. Not because it's not necessarily because it's the best thing for the tree. I think it is, but because it's so rewarding for us. Yeah. Like I feel like I'm just such a better person because of my relationship with my trees. Mm -hmm. I was we we had a stewardship day. in August or something, and I was on my knees, and I was working on the uh, circles around the trees, loosening up the soil, adding some nice compost. Actually, I wasn't adding compost at that time. It was too late. But, you know, working and loosening, weeding the soil, and I'm under this tree, and it's a hot day, and I say to myself, thank you, tree, Hmm. for being here so I can care for you. You know, it's not even for me. It's not always even about the fruit. It's just a gratitude in all all it offers us. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the show and sharing your experience with us today, Susan. It has been a treat getting to chat with you. Well, thank you so much for having having me on the show. I so appreciate chatting with you, and it's lovely to speak to a kindred spirit yeah. about these things. All right, back at you. So how can our listeners get a hold of you? The best thing to do is go to orchardpeople.com. Mm-hmm. And uh, you can sign up for my newsletter. I send out a newsletter once a month Perfect. and it's packed with information and links to new videos I've made and all sorts of stuff. There's also a contact us page. So if anybody wants to contact me and ask me any questions or send me pictures, I'm, I'm one of these crazy people. I like it when people send me pictures like, oh, I've got this oh, yes. freaky problem with my uh-huh. tree because then either I know or I get to research it. Yeah. So feel free to contact me personally through the website. And uh, yeah, and I so look forward to, to meeting your listeners. Perfect. Perfect. And so you also, the discount code for your online course is GROW723. Yes. yes. Uh, they get 20% off perfect. the cost of the course. Perfect. And the name of your book one more time is? Is Growing Urban Orchards. Perfect. Well, you can find more information in the show notes from today's podcast at urbanfarm.org backslash orchard people. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for joining us on the Urban Farm Podcast. My favorite plant to grow in my yard is the fruit tree because you plant it once and you get fruit for decades. If you have ever been curious on the best ways to be successful in growing fruit trees, today is your lucky day. Why? Because my team and I have compiled our best interviews and videos in one place to assist you in growing your own toe-tingling peaches and awesome apples right out your front or back door. Plus, as an added bonus, we've included an in-depth guide to successfully growing fruit trees in your yard. To get access to this information, it's free by the way, just go to urbanorchard.org or text FRUIT to 33444. That's urbanorchard.org or text FRUIT to 33444. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen three days a week for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.